Right, thank you, everyone. We're at 11.25, so I'd like to, or we'd like to resume the, the hearing. Um, I'm going to open by asking, asking a question based on one of the submissions we've already heard. Mr. Mr. Johnson, you made a, made a submission about a, uh, a site that's, that is at or was at inquiry recently. Is that, is that, I noted that down and worked it out that it was ST8. That's correct, sir. I, I was trying to avoid naming individual sites. But you, I was giving it there as an example. <laughs> yes, your, your neighbour mentioned it, which which was helpful. But yeah, I, 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 I'd worked it out. No, he, I, he dubbed me in. I could see that. <laughs> I, what what I was interested in, um, I mean, it, it, it's probably a matter that we'll have to come on to when we deal with site specifics. But you went through some of the contributions that you were asked to make as part of that inquiry process. And I wondered in particular about the, um, the Gypsy and Traveller element. Can you, can you just let me know briefly how, how that came about and what that's based on? Uh, yes, sir. I mean, I, I, it's not to say that we didn't challenge it um, because the evidence base isn't fantastic. But where it comes about is that there is a policy within the plan, and no doubt we'll come on to the policy in later sessions, that requires for major sites to make either a contribution to Gypsy and Traveller pictures off-site or to make provision for Gypsy and Travellers on-site. And both elements are in the policy ST8, which you have to say at this moment in time is a draft policy and it was agreed between the parties carries little weight at this moment in time because of the status of the plan. However, in giving a nod to the evidence base, is that it was drafted into the Section 106 agreement that an off-site contribution at £150,000 a pitch would be made. And the £150,000 a pitch is in the Council's evidence base under viability as to the cost of actually constructing an uh, a, a gypsy and traveller pitch on a new site, wherever, wherever that may be. And there is uh, another um, decision inspector's decision on a strategic site on the other side of York, um, which also includes a similar contribution to Gypsy and Travellers. That one was 300,000 based upon two pitches. That's helpful. We'll, we'll come on to those specific policies in due course, so I don't want to go down that road yeah. right now. But I think there was a point, Simon, you wanted to make, wasn't there? About having, is there a hook in the actual allocation policy that well, that, that deals with gypsy and traveller provision. It might be something that we need to take, make a note of for when the, we come on to the site specific. The, the, there is, sir, yes. If, if, in, in ST8, as I call it, is policy SS10. There is a hook in um, major sites, major strategic sites making provision for gypsy and traveller. There is another hook, actually, which is to do with self-build. Um, but that, in terms of its viability, one would imagine provided on site washes its own face to, to a large extent, whereas a, a contribution, substantial contribution, is off site in this particular case for gypsy and travellers. It, it applies just to the major strategic sites, it doesn't go all the way down to the, the smaller allocations. That, that's helpful, thank you. Can I assist? The, um, the, the um, headline points in the viability, and we'll come on to this in due course, he keeps saying, um, uh, don't refer to this, but if you look at the technical notes, you'll see that a consistent approach has been taken and contributions for gypsy pictures is included in the technical notes. So, for example, if you look on... This is the uh, Appendix 2 to our hearing statement, page 29 of 46, um, uh, for that particular uh, set of uh, costings. You'll see under, sorry, I can't read it, <laughs> under heading 4.6, other planning obligations, you'll see at 4.6.6, uh, uh, an allowance of 150,000 per pitch included. So that point hasn't passed us by. And I hope we're adopting a position consistent with the 106 obligations that are being proposed um, in uh, applications that are going forward at the minute. Um, yeah, and I, I want to uh, ask a slightly wider 
um, question, and that is, um, well, Mr. Um, Ridge um, was saying, I think, in effect, that um, you know, the detail um, of quite a lot of this stuff um, is, well, in effect, too detailed um, for the local plan. And in, in terms of some elements, such as walking and cycling, as you've described to us this morning, you don't know what that detail is yet. Um, as I understand the council's approach to this, um, it's more about setting this local plan not quite first of all, but um, it's not one thing exactly follows the other, um, but that the walking and cycling work will be informed by what this local plan looks like um, once it's adopted. Have I got that right? Yes. Um, I think it's may, may be useful if I say a little bit about how we're taking forward a range of policy documents at the moment across the council. Um, that would be very helpful, and if you can address my, my question at the same time, that, that, that might just work, um, which is um, just to be reassured um, that the local plan has the necessary, in, in the absence of the detail, that it has the necessary policy hooks in it um, so that you can achieve what, what you want to. It, it does. So, in terms of the local plan itself, if you look at the site-specific policies and the transport policies, there are numerous references to sustainable transport and sustainable transport provision for individual sites. A number of the larger sites have a bus mode share target of 15 percent, for example, which is um, a, quite an ambitious target. We're going to have to work very hard to deliver that through the investment that we've got in the bus network. Uh, we have, you know, a, a, a way to do that. Um, that investment takes us to the end of the current Parliament, and one thing that we'll be working on immediately after this examination is how we start putting together the business cases for the, some of the individual um, pieces of infrastructure we need to provide. In terms of how the Council is approaching this, in terms of generating policy, at the moment we are working on, I suppose, five areas of policy simultaneously this is this is one obviously the local plan uh, forms a very important input into that process because it will tell us where the spatial pattern of development is and and the amount of development that's taking place and also the impacts that that has on things like the transport network alongside this local plan we're also devising an economic strategy a carbon reduction strategy which we'll be talking about tomorrow uh, uh, and a public health strategy. And all of those, because transport is what we call a, a derived demand, people don't travel for the sake of it, but they travel because they are doing other things. They travel to you know, access opportunities, get to work, travel to school, et cetera, et cetera. So transport, we see it very much as some, something that follows from other activity that's happening in the city, and you know, that transport itself is an activity that generates externalities like carbon, um, noise, um, you know, and we have to mitigate that. So we are developing a local transport strategy that sets out how we will accommodate the local plan growth, the economic strategy, the carbon reduction plan, the public health strategy, and the impacts that that has on the transport network. And a part of that will be detail about um, walking and cycling networks across York, as well as the other sustainable modes, like public transport. And we, we intend to make that document available um, in the autumn, and, and some of that document will come to phase four of the examination. Could, could I also add to that that we had a, a brief discussion during the coffee break, and it may be helpful, we think, um, it's not, it doesn't go to the soundness of the plan, I suppose it's a matter for us ultimately, but that we might update the explanatory text to set out, much, uh, to set out in a bit more detail the proposals that are coming forward and to explain the tie between the local plan policies and the emerging uh, strategy and the walking and cycling plan. Is that just to in essence, explain some of the things that Mr. Ridge has been exactly. telling us. Exactly, and we think it might be helpful if we put it up front in the text, in the plan, in the transports uh, chapter.
Uh, yeah, I, I, you, you may well be right, Mr. Elvin. It, it may or may not be a main modification in terms of soundness. But if, if we could have a look at have a look at that, I'd be grateful. Mr. Corsier. Thank you, sir. Um, can I take you back to your question 6.2? Does the plan take a justified and suitably evidenced approach to infrastructure requirements? So we say no, and so uh, we just remind you of our position on obviously infrastructure has environmental implications as well as transport and other implications and so can I just remind you that the SA, the Heritage Impact Assessment and, and the Greenbelt Appraisal, none of those actually consider the impacts of the infrastructure required to serve the major sites and in particular ST15. I think that's the first point sir, to say. Secondly sir, it hasn't been referred to today, surprisingly, is, of course, a statement of common ground with national highways. Now, I know, I understand, sir, that, that, that things may change, but we have to obviously look at position now. These are the phase two hearings, after all. And I think it's very important to, if we go through that, sir, I don't know if you have that in front of you, but just to record what is yet to be agreed or may not be agreed. And so, very importantly, on, under areas on which the Council and National Highways are yet to reach agreement, and then very important word, whether, whether schemes to mitigate significant impacts of local plan development on the A64 can be developed and delivered within the required timescales. That's a weather, sir, not a how we're we going to do this, or it is, there is currently no agreement on whether you can do that. And that's a huge matter, sir, because the largest development proposal of this plan depends on that being secured. If it helps, we have noted the wording in the Statement of Common Ground. Yes, sir. <laughs> If I can make it clear, of course, there is, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is work in progress with National Highways. That's accepted. Uh, and Mr. Corsi, of course, wishes to put as pessimistic a spin on it as possible, um, which we don't accept. But, of course, there are detailed work streams um, with National Highways. They have set out accurately the position in their statement of common ground, and we're working on that. They have some of, uh, they've got our modelling information, but they have to undertake their own modelling for the National Highways Network. So the, the degree of circumspection is entirely to be um, understood in, in that context. Um, we think that this is capable of being resolved, but we, under, we, we accept, and we've already made it clear in the Statement of Common Ground, that there is work that is still ongoing. Um, with respect to Mr. Corsier, and I'll be dealing with this in my response to his uh, SA note, which unfortunately I haven't had time to finish yet, is that um, he does not recognise that um, sustainability appraisals uh, are iterative documents um, and that they will change and vary over time. And this has been accepted by the courts. This will all be dealt with in my note. But the fact that matters change and further information comes forward is not a matter for surprise. And indeed, it would be surprising if it didn't. So, with respect, um, the, st the Statement of Common Ground says what it says. Um, those work streams are underway and are being taken very seriously by the Council and expect to resolve them, but they won't be resolved today. Sir, so I've made my point. Um, so, very importantly, if we go through that paragraph 10, so it records at the present moment there is no financial commitment by the government to the upgrade of the Hopgrove um, junction and the planned scheme as it stands does not 
it has not been designed to mitigate local plan aspirations. Again, sir, that's... I don't think we have a costing for, for the additional works, sir, in the, in the new document. I haven't... I've looked for it, but I can't find it. I'm sorry, Mr. Cossey, you said paragraph 10 um, of the Statement of Common Ground. Yes, sir. I'm reading now. I've gone back to the Statement of Common Ground. So, again, we, very importantly, so we are recorded that the major works are required at Grimston Bar. I just, I think the new document puts in a figure, I think, of, I think, £3 million for that. So, which would not achieve very many works. So we also have recorded in, I think at, at this point, it's on, um, it's on the next section, sir, that there is a new, there's a need for an overall access strategy for site ST15, which you don't have in front of you the present moment. Now, so again, Mr. Elvin will say that that has been produced, but we are now four years on from submission. So again, we have recorded there that the, a new A64 grade separated junction can be designed to provide direct access to site ST15 on the proviso that a safe layout in terms of DMRB standards and operational effectiveness can be delivered by the site promoter. There is no yet agreement on that matter. And so the next bullet point, we say that mitigation measures are likely to be required at the 19 Fulford Road Junction. That, as far as I can see, fi fo finds is, is not identified anywhere in, in any of the documentation. And so the, there's no agreement yet on the impact of the local plan on the strategic road network, including the full extent of mitigation that may be required. Huge area of work, sir or indeed the cost of a DMRB compliant grade separated junction for ST15. We say, sir, that there is a huge area of uncertainty as we currently stand, which really should have been resolved by the time we reach this stage of the examination process. The second area, sir, we would just direct your attention to. I, th I think I'm right, sir. Again, I'm trying to look at the document. Under education, for ST15, as an example, I think it probably applies to other sites as well, that the actual primary school provision will not be provided until 2032. That's in conflict with the actual local plan, which should, says it should be provided in the earliest phases. So again, this is another, yet another inconsistency between what the plan says and what is being proposed by the council. And so we have directed your attention to a number of these items. And so by that point, on the Gantt chart, 970 dwellings would have been provided on site. So there's no reference in the infrastructure to any air quality measures which are required to mitigate impacts. And so just to point, pack, pick up a matter which we, we dealt with at under matter three, the new document, and I'm sorry, so I lost my reference to it, um, actually f accepts so that, I'm trying to read, it's under paragraph 23, sir, of the new document. Accepts that working from home is now going to be a permanent feature. 
And that's the second line, sir. It says the likely permanent reduction in peak time commuting as a result of travel behavior during the COVID pandemic. This again, again, another disco, obviously, that we've directed you also to other inconsistencies on the council's vision in this regard. And so lastly, I think Mr. Elvin was yet again setting up a straw man when he was saying that our position was that these sites had to be totally self-contained. These the new settlements had to be totally self-contained. So it's, that isn't our position. Our position, however, is because it will only provide basic facilities, and now we're seeing that they are going to be provided quite late in the phasing. These are going to be highly car dependent, which is not the same point at all. And it's that car dependency which we say is not compatible with national policy or indeed the plan zone objectives. So that, that, those points I want to make, or make here. Um, there are some points we'd like to make under viability as well, but this isn't the time. Mr May. Thank you, sir. Um, I wanted to comment particularly on questions 6.1 and 6.2. Uh, first of all, to say I'm, I'm very much of the same mind as Mr. Ridge, that now is not the time to get into the detail of local cycling and walking in infrastructure plans. Um, as I said last week, the Civic Trust's position is that we really want to see this local plan in place and we want to provide support to ensure that it is sound and internally consistent. Um, what worries us with the three documents we now have, the Infrastructure Development Plan, CYC 70, and now CYC 79, is that none of them explains why um, these particular infrastructure schemes are needed to support the local plan, or why others are not. Um, there's no um, analysis of um, the impact of these schemes uh, in terms of their ability, I'm thinking here particularly of the transport schemes, in terms of their ability to reduce the 65% predicted growth in congestion or as Mr. Ridge had it, 35% increase in congestion per journey that's predicted. Um, there is some analysis in the transport topic paper, um, and that already includes the upgrades to the roundabouts on the outer ring road and new highway access to um, uh, strategic sites, ST5714, and 15, and the 65% increase arises despite doing that. Therefore, despite providing most of the extra capacity on the outer ring road. Um, no attempt has yet been made, as far as we can tell, to modify, to model any of the other transport infrastructure projects. Looking quickly at ST, um, 79, uh, CYC 79, um, as far as I can see, the main addition has been some notional costings. And it's worth bearing in mind, looking at ST15, that we now have a figure of £2 million to provide improved bus access, £4 million to provide um, improved walking and cycling access, and £63 million to provide highway access. Um, and, and that balance just doesn't seem to be compatible with the aims of the local plan in terms of encouraging uh, sustainable travel. Um, our view, therefore, is that the, as things stand at the moment, the plan does not yet take what you ask for, which is a justified and suitably evidence-based approach to infrastructure requirements. Neither does it set out the infrastructure requirements in sufficient detail. 
what we think is needed, and which we're very happy to support, is an analysis of the mitigation measures which would most effectively offset this predicted increase in congestion and begin to go some way towards the climate change strategy which we'll discuss tomorrow, assesses that list of possible solutions against the policy objectives, shortlists those which are most cost effective, and then demonstrates that they will be effective in achieving the Council's objectives. That's quite a tall order. Um, Mr. Ridge has already referred to a further analysis of the Council's new model um, in time for uh, phase three of the inquiry, and we welcome that. But as I understand it, it will not be possible in that time scale to look at all the mitigation measures. And our recommendation to you, sir, therefore, is that it would be appropriate to instruct the Council, ask the Council if you wish, um, to carry out such an analysis in time for phase four and defer decisions on the transport infrastructure and the broader transport strategy until then. And as I say, we are very happy to help in that process um, to any extent that we can. Thank you. Mr. Alvin. At risk of repeating myself, um, the issue that Mr. Corsier read out from the Statement of Common Ground with National Highways is, as I said, work in progress. So far as the approach taken to highways and other transportation sustainable measures that uh, has been described by Mr. Ridge, it's in the update paper, and we don't agree uh, with uh, uh, Professor May that um, it requires the level of analysis he suggests. We will, of course, undertake the further work in the light of the later model. I'm going to ask Mr. Ridge to comment in a minute. Um, and as I've already said, uh, um, assessment of uh, impacts and sustainability is an ongoing process. Um, Council has its own team. We're grateful for the offer of support, but procurement of uh, third party assistance would take even longer. <laughs> We've got, got appointed consultants who will uh, assist. Um, can I ask Mr. Oh, uh, it was. Oh, yes. Um, Mr. Corsier raised a point about the funding for uh, Grimston being insufficient. Uh, that, that is because it isn't the funding that's, uh, the separate funding is a short-term upgrade before the grade separated works are carried out. For ST15, uh, infrastructure works can be phased. So for example, you go from a situation where initially for a small amount of housing, uh, you only need an access road onto Elvington Lane as a secondary access with a junction. You then proceed to an upgrade to Elvington Lane with, those imp with an improved capacity uh, exercise at Grimston, which is what that couple of million pounds relates to. You then, to get past a certain number of houses, you will need to have the grade separated works, which um, are a greater degree of expenditure. All of that is currently being modelled and is being uh, discussed in detail with the promoters and, of course, with National Highways. Um, as I say, the Statement of Common Ground with National Highways sets out the work streams that are currently proceeding, and I've already made uh, my comments on those. But I'll ask Mr. Ridge for any further comments. Um, I, I was just going to add a, a little bit about the timing of the, the modelling work that we're doing. Um, I think... I, I can say quite truthfully that the last sort of three years has involved a, a level of churn in the travel market that uh, none of us expected to see. And in terms of modelling for the medium to long term, as we're, we, we're doing for the local plan, that um, throws up some challenges. And I think we had to wait for two things to happen. So the first thing we needed to wait for was um, our Saturn transport model, which we'd used extensively in York up until about 2020 to be 
replaced by a new model, and we and we now have this new VISM model, um, which is a much more uh, effective and detailed tool, particularly because it can model uh, the transfer between different modes of transport, which is something we couldn't do before. So we can model, you know, if you improve a bus route on a on on a particular road, how many people will transfer from using the car to that, and it can it can do something similar with the park and ride network that we have, and that that's a big. Um, big increase in our capability. The, the other thing, of course, we had to wait for was for the travel market to mature a bit following the pandemic so that we could make some assumptions about what demand was likely to, to look like going forward. I think it, as it has matured, it has begun to look quite similar to the situation which prevailed before the pandemic, although we, we didn't know that uh, 18 or even six months ago, but it is beginning to look like that. But, Nonetheless, it means a lot of the modelling work that we've done has adopted quite a conservative assumption that travel patterns are as they were in 2019, um, whereas we know in practice there has been quite a bit of change, particularly in commuting. Um, and we've, uh, as a result of that, we are currently overstating our estimates of congestion and delay on the network because we are assuming 2019 type travel patterns, um, whereas I think in reality there is less movement in the peaks, the days in the middle of the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, which traditionally are very busy and more like Mondays and Fridays, which were less busy. Uh, so there is, a, there is a degree of robustness built into the modelling uh, that we will be refining uh, as we move forward, but means at the moment that what we produce is quite conservative. Mr. Clark. Just uh, uh, briefly on this on this issue in, in uh, matter 6.2 uh, about what, what constitutes sufficient detail as regards um, infrastructure requirements, particularly with regard to sustainable transport. If I could quote from um, the uh, Department for Transport uh, gear change document July last year. We expect sustainable transport issues to be considered from the earliest stages of plan making. Now, um, uh, the, the, the question then devolves upon what, what is it to consider. Um, what it is that Mr. Ridge seems to be saying uh, is that, well, we shouldn't worry because we've, we've considered all of that. Um, however, um, the, the summary principle three of um, of the gear change document, the DFT document, says cyclists must be physically separated and protected from high volume motor traffic both at junctions and on the stretches of road between them. Um, uh, such detail has not been, uh, as far as it was certainly not uh, on the plan and even on this, this latest document does not do this. Um, I just want to suggest to you that um, a line drawn on a map and keyed to, quote, cycle corridor in the light of the Department for Transport July 21 document is not sufficient detail, particularly as regards the delivery aspect of the particular question. Mr. Elvin. Can I just ask Mr. Clark, can you just give me the reference to that DFT document, please? Sure. Um, it's uh, Department for Transport. Uh, it's called Gear Change, July 2021. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Um We work with the Gear Change document extensively and with LTN 120, which is the uh, 
detailed highway specification guidance that sits underneath gear change. Um, but it, it, it will form an important part of our local cycling and walking infrastructure plan when we, when we take that forward. Um, uh, I mean, I think it's, it's fair to say that the, the local plan that we're examining now was published three years before gear change. Um, so although it's, it's an important part of our local transport planning function, um, it, it's not something that we have considered in detail with regards to the plan. Can I also add, sorry, I was just wanting to check the document. The document is, is advising a step change from the position as from 2018. And uh, as Mr. Ridge has indicated, as you know, the plan started life long before this document was published. It's not being ignored, but of course, as with any change in government guidance, when it's, uh, particularly when it's ramping up the requirements, of course, th there needs to be time to deal with it and to react appropriately. And we've already got um, a, a plan uh, coming forward, which will take it into account. If, if I may, just very briefly, um, it seems to me that this, this DFT publication makes clear what should, what should anyway have been considered as primary principles in the plan from draft, but we're certainly not. Mr. Merritt. Thank you. Um, this part, this I think, follows fairly um, nicely off the uh, previous contributions. But I, I want to go back to the council's uh, statements and, and Mr. Ridge's statements about their approach to dealing with transport in this plan. In effect, what they're saying is um, they've got a generalised approach at the moment but a lot of the detail uh, will be carried out later. And um, I again draw the inspector's requirement, uh, attention to the basic plan requirement that there should be an adequate evidence base in terms of transport. And the DFT's 2015 guidance on transport evidence bases in plan making and decision taking which is in effect the reference document for what should have been done. And as I've previously, uh, in, matter, in the matter four hearings, made the point, the council has not carried out what it is required. The evidence base does not meet the guidance, and that is why the plan is unsound, and more particularly why we're in such difficulties today, because they haven't done the work that they should have done uh, in order to, to fully identify all the things that need to be done to uh, be included in the infrastructure uh, base. Now, Sorry, in, in, just in saying that, Mr. Merritt, um, is there anything specific that you have in mind that you haven't mentioned already? Um, um, well, I, um, I wanted to support um, what Tony Moe was saying about how we can try and rectify this, but also to secure your agreement that basically final decisions on the infrastructure delivery plan should wait until we have both the information on the revised uh, transport project, uh, and traffic projections, but also the mitigations that the council propose and the measures that are required. And you know, those should include identifications of, uh, if, if you look at the 2015 guidance, identification of gaps in the networks, all networks, all mode networks, not just the highways. So that includes public transport, that includes uh, the cycling uh, networks and options for addressing them. And you know, the, the reality is we have major congestion problems in this city. It is negatively affecting um, the, the economy of this city, lives in this city, air quality in this city, carbon emissions in this city. None of the, two, the latter two have been quantified, as Mr. Corsier has outlined, and that was covered. You know, carbon and air quality 
pollution are listed in the 2015 guidance. So the councils had seven years, seven years to have done this work. Why, why are we here now without it? Um, so, you know, we, 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 <laughs> this particular matter is premature because until we have that additional information, you don't have the adequate, uh, an adequate evidence base on which to make decisions. Thank you. Yes, at the risk of a really bad pun, I'm not sure how much mileage there is uh, left in this particular um, discussion, um, and I'm, I'm considering moving on to the viability um, aspect. Um, um, so, unless there is anything else um, on questions 6.1 through to 6.4, just to remind everyone that those were the, um, the, the points that we were covering in this part of the discussion. Um, if there is anything else, then please do indicate now. Thank you, Mr. May. Thank you, sir. I just wanted to pick up a point on question 6.4. Um, has the cost of these infrastructure elements um, been estimated reasonably robustly. Um, we do have concerns that some of the costings in the Council's documents are underestimates of what is needed. The, I've looked now at um, CYC 79 and that still quotes the figure of 4.9 million um, for um, active travel enhancements throughout the network as opposed to those in specific sites. Um, and we do need to bear in mind, as Mr. Merritt's already indicated, that Tadcasta Road itself, one of perhaps 10 radial corridors, was allocated 1.43 million. Um, and that was not sufficient to overcome the most serious barriers. So I, I think those figures do need to be looked at again and looked at more realistically. And I rather suspect the same may be true with the um, figures that are now uh, appearing for um, bus and walking and cycling access to ST 14 and 15. Um, it would seem to me that £2 million for bus access to um, ST15 was almost certainly going to be an underestimate of what is needed. Thank you. I'm terribly sorry, I can't, I can't read your name oh, plate. I'm sorry, <coughs> Graham Collett. Mr Collett. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I wanted to make a point about the importance of um, high quality public transport to the strategic sites. But before doing so, I just wanted to support the point that Mr. Coursier made earlier and others that we've only been made aware of this uh, updated paper in coming to this meeting today. And we're all volunteers working in our, own, in our spare time. So, you know, that, that is a, an issue I would suggest the inquiry in terms of procedure. Um, yeah, I mean, look, um, we, we agree, um, and, and we, we are going to um, allow, you know, written um, representations on that. Um, as I think I mentioned earlier, we, we, we'll, we'll put something up on the um, on the examination web page once we've worked out precisely when the, the deadline for that needs to be. Thank you. Um, on the bus um, bus services to the sites, um, I, I think we do need for the local plan to be sound, to have 
um, pretty clear assurances about what's going to be provided without necessarily going into great detail, but certainly on the nature of it and the costs. And I don't feel that what I've seen so far and what I've briefly seen on the XC79 um, really gives us that information. It's clear that a, um, a, a, some form of limited bus services, fast, fast limited stock bus services to the sites are going to be needed if they're going to attract people away from cars, particularly with the huge increase in congestion that is being forecast. Thank you. Okay, are there any other points from this side of the table before I, I take the final word from, from the council's um, side and then I'll, um, I'll move on to viability? No? Okay, very good, thank you. Yes. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, um, I just wanted to come back about some of the individual figures that were quoted from the... Um, infrastructure plan, particularly by Professor May, um, just to provide some context for what they actually are. So the £4.9 million pounds for uh, cycling and walking measures, that is um, a sum of money which is currently committed in our existing local transport plan budget. So that is the sum total of everything that we've got going on in the city now. Um, it is not the total of everything that will be pursued over the local plan period, but because um, we're, we're developing that policy, and particularly we're developing the local cycling and walking infrastructure plan, we didn't want to give an indicative value before we knew what that was likely to be. Um, the £2 million given for bus measures um, in relation to ST15 is actually the revenue contribution for running services. It doesn't include any of the physical infrastructure. We have a separate £5 million um, ask within our bus service uh, improvement plan for that. It's beyond the end of this Parliament, so it hasn't been granted, but we are working on the business case for that. Uh, we recognise that there will be a need for investment to deliver that. Um, and I, I think that was, the, yeah, that was a, the, the point I wish to make. So there, there are there are pieces of in infrastructure which we are, which we are working towards. It's, and, and as I said, the list in the um, document is not exhaustive. Sorry, actually, one, one final point that just occurs to me is that the um, £63 million pounds that was uh, notified as a highway cost for ST15, of course those roads will be available for use by other modes, so they will be used by the bus network, and that, include, and that cost includes segregated off-road cycle paths um, by the side of the two access roads. So it's not, it, it's not simply that all of that money would simply be devoted to motorised modes. A lot of it would go to sustainable mode provision as well. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'm going then, um, I think, to move on to um, the question of viability, and that is issues 6.5 um, 
through to 6.8 um, inclusive. Um, and what I think um, might be helpful for the hearing um, is if the council um, takes us on a short tour um, of the work that um, it, has, it has done on viability, just to be sure that we, we all fully understand um, where, where the council stands. So I'm, I'm Ross Porter from Porter Planning Economics and we were commissioned originally when I was working on behalf of Peter Brett Associates um, to undertake a viability assessment of the local plan and that's in line with the MPPF 2012 where it needs to assess that the plan is um, not hindered by its cumulative impacts of its policy on delivery. And effectively, we're looking at local plan policies and to ensure that those that are put in the plan are able to be afforded by the bulk of development within the area, i.e. those plans are supposed to not put a serious risk of delivery of all sites. So, in terms of the, the work, there was um, some original work that was done early on by Peter Brett Associates, um, which was 2017. And that was then, with new information, um, including some changes in policies, that was updated to a new viability assessment in April 2018, which is in the core documents CD018. And at that time, all the planning policies within the publication draft 2018, Reg 19 consultation document, or PDR C 2018, we have it referenced throughout that report, was, were assessed. Um, and in that report, in table 3.1, we went through each policy in turn and identified through a RAG, which is a red, amber, green approach to see whether they would have a, what we call a, a significant impact for viability. And those that were highlighted in red were then pulled out for us to apply a metric to it, i.e. cost, some order of cost that would show if that was to be imposed on the de development, would it undermine sites coming forward? And then in chapter six of that report, we set out all our development assumptions and we make sure that they were very open and very transparent so anybody who was looking at that report could replicate what we had tested in terms of development assumptions. And those development assumptions were largely through our own experience of development viability, of plan making, but importantly as well, they were undertaken through consultation with local developers, any key stakeholders within York who were operating in the development market to assess whether these were reasonable assumptions to be tested. And generally, most of the assumptions are what we would call fairly general and standard industry assumptions, what you apply. Mm -hmm. But likewise, we referenced local understanding of those assumptions. So things like sales values, build costs, um, were all assessed from the local market context to ensure that we are capturing um, a correct and accurate picture for a high level viability assessment. Mm -hmm. And we also set out um, the policy costs within that same chapter um, of that document, CD018. And then, having run the viability work at that time, in chapter six, and particularly um, table uh, 6.1, 6 um, in chapter six, we identified whether sites would come forward under those policies. And by sites, we looked at two types of sites. Effectively, what we should be doing is looking at typology, so it would cover most types of sites that would 
be realistic in this area. So what is the market generally delivering? And they tend to capture the more windfall type allocations that could come anywhere. But also importantly, we looked at each of the allocated strategic sites mm -hmm. to ensure that we captured them. And by that, we looked at the key parameters for those sites in terms of site areas, um, densities, and um, any specific policy costs that would apply to those. So we, we tested a range of sites, so quite a wide range, and at the, uh, in, in the results themselves, all the strategic sites pretty much were green, i.e. they identified a positive headroom, a headroom that could go back into the development industry as extra land value or extra profit if needed, but they met the minimum to get those across that viability line. And the same as for the, the uh, typology of sites, there was a couple of small sites that may have had a, an amber. And these are sites that are tested with all those key policies applied to them, including affordable housing, um, including the, um, if, if it applied, the Gypsy and Traveller pitches, as was mentioned earlier. And also including sustainability uh, requirements for sustainable construction methods, etc. Then, for the plan um, that's been examined, uh, we now understand a bit more about some of the infrastructure requirements. More work has been undertaken to assess what those requirements could be on those strategic sites and all other generic sites across the city. So, we revisited the viability work in the additional note that was provided for Matter 6 by the Council, which is their Appendix 2. And in some regards, the results in that report now, I would say, um, is to replace the earlier work that was undertaken and published in April 2018. Yeah, that's something I want to be absolutely clear about. So is it solely this technical note, the, the um, appendix or addendum, I can't remember which you called it. Yeah, so, so is, is it that, that the council now relies on, or is it a combination of the two, two documents? You'll find, for example, that the, t the typologies um, uh, general explanation is in Table 5.1 of CD18. So I think it's a combination. It's just some of the, the details have been updated. So you need both, I think. So, yes, I'd agree. In terms of the results themselves in that CD, um, uh, sorry, in the, um, yeah, in the appendix 2, are what we should be referring to. And those res results are identified as table A9 and A10. In terms of the finer detail of the work, I would refer to CD018, which was set out more about the market conditions, uh, how we came about assessing sites, the types of sites we looked at, and some other development assumptions. But in the, in the uh, effectively a technical note on the uh, viability update, as it, it does include some other changes that have occurred that we felt it would be beneficial to have a look at for this, because um, uh, we was doing an update, one of which was changes market conditions, and there have been some substantial changes over the last few years that have been captured. And also, there was an additional policy that we felt um, may merit some assumption which relates to, um, I can tell you this shortly. GI28. GI28. 2A. 2A, sorry. Which is the um, area of conservation, which is strategic area of, uh, special area of conservation, so it's a strength or common. In addition to that, we undertook further work on considering the climate change emer uh, climate emergency agenda and applied some additional costs because there will be some impacts on viability from those. And in addition, we include mandatory changes that are likely to be seen very soon, although still... Sorry, for, forgive me. Um, the, the, the climate emergency additional costs you mentioned, what, what kind of thing does that relate to? So effectively, that would be moving towards a, a, zero, a, a carbon zero target for new homes by 2009, 2030. The 
my understanding. By, by 2030, you say? Yes. And that the reason for that? Because uh, the councils uh, have adopted in their uh, the council plan uh, a climate emergency agenda where they want to be able to push in advance of where the gov national government is going in terms of making sure that the city is sustainable. Sorry, I just, just want to have clarification. So effectively, it would be relating to policies CC2 and CC3, which is a requirement for meeting sustainable construction. <laughs> and just to sort of finish off on in terms of those other changes in, in the update note, is that we allowed for potential mandatory changes that the national government is going to be introduced in regards to biodiversity net gain of 10 percent electrical charging vehicle electrical vehicle charging points and yeah sorry and, and they're the only two really at, the, at this stage that we understand will be mandatory changes there'll be a few other changes through building regulations as well related to sustainable construction methods but that's part informed our work for assessing policy CC2 and CC3. Okay, so that then is an attempt, is it, at, oh, I hate this phrase, but I'm going to use it, horizon scanning at what might be coming down the road and um, trying to encapsulate and embed that within your appraisal work. Exactly, I mean, what we're trying to do is make sure the sites are deliverable and uh, the policies would come forward if they did have to also allow for those potential costs. Um, can I all just ask Mr. Porter also just to touch on the issue of development density assumptions uh, and the update for the individual sites is at table A1 of page 2 of the Appendix 2 update. Uh, yes, sir. so in regards to the trajectory for the strategic sites, we, we updated... Um, in terms of the sites that we tested, the details on those sites we updated to allow for any changes in yield. And those yields are based on planning applications coming forward through the scheme. So they were passed to us by the council to make sure that we are testing the right number of units for those allocations. In there, we also allow for densities, and densities reflect the policy requirements in H2 against those sites. So based on their location, um, we applied a different range of densities. Most of the strategic sites coming forward with a, in relative terms, I suppose almost a, a low density at 35 dwellings, um, but also still, if you allow for sites that are within the more urban city area, uh, where you get more flatted schemes likely, they have much higher densities. Okay, so you've updated then the CD18 um, work in this technical note, and you, you've just described to us some of the <coughs> some of the changes um, that you've picked up in terms of um, market conditions, policy assumptions, um, etc. Um, so overall, then, what does the technical note conclude in relation to viability? Has there been any any notable um, change in viability either of the um, strategic sites or the um, what's the word 
typologies? Uh, no, sir. The conclusion is exactly the same, that the, the, the cumulative impact of local plan policies on development would not uh, undermine future delivery of the local plan. All the sites did come forward as green. Um, the one exception, in our initial testing, which actually is a very important point to raise, um, is site ST15, which is now SS13. And so, okay, Biff. So there, uh, the, um, it has a, a very large requirement in terms of infrastructure costs, which we allowed for. And however, it's not perfect and it's not an accurate viability assessment. It's a very high level one. And in doing so, we, we're looking at not assessing and then making it all work at the margin of viability. We tended to give a little bit of conservatism to some of our assumptions with regards to what development costs are likely to be and, and over egg some and there's a degree of double counting. But in particular on strategic sites, anything that's fairly large now, what is pretty much universally agreed in any plan testing is that when you're looking at national house builders developing on site, they don't build at the average cost of a home because they benefit substantially from economies of scale. And in that regard, we're starting to use lower build costs now when we test any sites above 50 units. So in this addendum, we just felt that that would warrant just understanding that market condition on, on those strategic sites, and particularly in regards to that site. And on doing so, it would show that it would wash its face in terms of coming forward and meeting all its policy requirements. I'd probably also raise as a, a degree of potential duplication and some assumptions I think has been raised a couple of times by some of the uh, participants here today. And I'll accept that, um, and it is on the basis that I'd rather overcost than undercost these uh, policy implications to ensure that we've got a deliverable plan. So that's to say double counting. I think you said duplication. Am I thinking of the right thing? Uh, actually, it's uh, double counting, effectively. Where, so when we're looking at, for instance, 106, we tested that on the basis in the um, CDO 18 document on the basis of 30 schemes that had been provided to us in terms of agreed S106 assumptions. And it came out that they averaged about £3,300 a unit. But then we um, had the infrastructure development plan, the Gantt chart, that's come out now, which identifies your bigger ticket items. Um, and therefore, we included that. And that would allow for things like education. And arguably, education was part of that original figure of £3,300 per unit as an average across those other schemes. So we haven't distilled that out of those figures. We've just allowed them and we've just added the extra costs from the infrastructure um, Gantt chart. And then there's also a degree of potential overcounting within strategic site costs themselves because some of those infrastructure items will be there to open up the sites. And generally we make allowance for on big, large greenfield sites that there would be a strategic open up cost and that was also retained in addition to including the infrastructure costs when we revised the report in the appendix to technical note. I'm sorry, I'm struggling a little bit with my eyesight today. I don't know if it's something to do with the light. I don't mean reading distance, even reading my own notes in front of me. I'm struggling a little bit. I don't know if it's because of the light or, or precisely what, but um, do forgive me. Mr. Oven, did you have anything to add? No, other, other than to make uh, the, the point, as, as, I, as I said earlier, we're, we're continuing discussions on individual strategic sites, including ST15, and we expect to present you with a more um, detailed uh, position, which uh, will take account of more realistic expectations in terms of phasing and delivery, which um, Mr. Porter will confirm is expected to make, to, to improve viability even over the conservative assumptions that have been made. Yeah, that's right. In terms of the work, it's, it is high level. It has to be for plan making. It's, 
it's high level proportionate type of analysis. So we don't have the details on all the specific phasing of sites. Same as the housing mix, we refer to the Schmar. So it's meeting the likely requirement for trying to achieve the Schmar meeting housing need. So, but when we come to working with uh, individual developers, we would be happy to test their understanding of infrastructure costs, the phasing of payment of infrastructure items, etc. For infrastructure items, I think, um, um, as um, David mentioned earlier, it's a fairly simplified process of, we added those costs in on each site. In the, it was a straight line cost, but it was applied in the first half of delivery. So all those costs effectively were paid by, if you balance out that straight line, about, by about 30% about of houses that are being built. The reality is that uh, things like schools will come later to meet you know, uh, child yields and new housing numbers, etc. So at this stage, without prejudice to any final assumptions, my understanding is probably that we'd see a better more rosy picture on some of those strategic sites as well. Perhaps I can give just, just as a simple example. Um, with ST15, you, you'll recall I said, um, in response to some of the earlier questions, there are a number of stages in terms of the infrastructure that are likely, and this, this is all being worked up at the minute, um, but it's anticipated, for example, that um, uh, there is a certain level of development which will be possible on ST15 before the grade separation, grade separated junction, the, the largest piece of infrastructure is required, uh, and therefore the development, uh, the infrastructure cross, costs are likely to be phased, not, not up front as they're assumed at the moment, but spread out over a longer period, so um, uh, the costs will not all be delivered in the first um, uh, for the first 50% of the development, but will be more uh, refined than that. So that's just a simple example of how we've taken a very conservative upfront assumption, which may be modified when we've uh, completed our detailed discussions. Is it assumed that schemes are wholly debt funded? Yes. Again, a, a conservative assumption, I hope. That's why I asked. Mr. Johnson. Uh, yes, thank you, sir. Just a couple of points. Um, I think overall, with the comments made by Mr. Porter, we actually agree with, it, with quite a few of those update comments in, with respect to, first of all, lower quartile build costs being used on the major strategic schemes where you're involving a house builder and the cost savings of the strategic sites. Then clearly you are coming in at less than the medium scale cost because of the, the cost savings as a result of the build cost. Um, there is an element of double counting. I know I've mentioned that before in the section 106 and the explanation just given in effect to the th circa 3,000 pound a dwelling overlap with education. I think we've noticed that that's right. So there is that over provision built into the section 106, which gives you that extra degree of comfort. But I don't think we necessarily need that degree of comfort. There are also some additional costs on some of the strategic sites, which may create even a, a further great uh, deal of comfort. And, and what I mean by reference to that is, for example, biodiversity net gain has been added as a cost. Well, on most of the strategic sites, I can't speak for all of them, but on most, I would imagine they will get to the 10% net gain uh, without having to make a further payment off-site. And there's a reference in there to Strensel Common um, compensation. Again, several, if not all, of the strategic sites will actually mitigate their own Strensel Common impacts on-site. So again, there's an additional buffer in the costing that may not necessarily come about. So overall, there are some additional costings in the assessments, which I, I think are uh, certainly double counting. Uh, and then my final point, sir, and it's more of a question back to the council on this point, is 
the reference to the £6,500 per dwelling for climate change bill cost uplift. And I just want to check on this. My understanding is, is that that's a reference to the 2025 regulations, which is the 70% improvement on the 2013 building regulations. That, in effect, is going towards...